All right. So I'll go ahead and start off with the uh, the land acknowledgement. Um, so Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center acknowledges that the Coast Salish people of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, the Puyallup, the Squamish, Tulalip, and the Muckleshoot Nations. Um, and then I will hand it off to Maxine um, for the welcome and the intro. Thank you, Joshua. Good morning, everyone. I am Maxine Ellis of the Department of DEI Corps. Um, I am Director of Coaching and Culture. I welcome you this morning to the second storytelling circle um, as a part of the Public Art and Community Dialogue Program. Uh, today, we are joined by another storyteller as we continue to define our commitment and solidarity with the indigenous community as a part of this program. With this program, systems of oppression depend on the public losing interest in movements driving transformative change. As an extension of our efforts to drive transformative change in our organization and greater community, Fred Hutch has taken an authentic, affirming, and active approach to sharing the message that Black, Indigenous, and people of color and other minoritized and underrepresented people matter to us in our science, in our community, and beyond. Driving the strength and motivation of this program is our interest in deepening our institutional community relationships. The program will also provide an opportunity for the select artists to connect, explore, or align with each other and representatives from the Fred Hutch. To inform, to inform their final commission work and future community initiatives. These art installations will serve to engage other underrepresented communities and, greater, and create broader and connected messages of solidarity. I'd like to pass it over to Dr. Joshua Marceau, our program manager for indigenous initiatives to take us through the dialogue. Joshua. Thanks, Maxine. Um, so these dialogues provide an opportunity for employees and the broader Seattle community um, to be in dialogue about community solidarity and our pursuit of equity in research and in healthcare. Um, and they foster, these discussions foster uh, ongoing dialogues with marginalized and oppressed communities to inform our commitment to inclusion um, and how we represent that commitment in visual form. Um, dialogue is an opportunity to share stories, lived experiences, reflections, history, uh, culture, and aspirations for holistic and sustained health. Um, and we invite that community um, that is joining us today to engage in the story storytelling circle that centers solidarity, history, culture, and traditions. Um, and this will be a two-way interaction between the listener and the storyteller. Um, and we encourage participants to use this time for personal reflection and connection. And um, these stories and reflections will inform our commitment to inclusion. And again, how we represent that, that commitment in, um, in visual form. Um, so I want to thank our artist selection committee, Craig D, Twyla Gleason, and Lenora Starr for helping us guide this work. Okay, and I will introduce our artists. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce our storytelling artist for today, Fern Naomi Rendell. Um, she is a Sisseton, Wapiton, Dakota, sorry, Fern, if I mispronounce this, <laughs> <laughs> um, Omaha and Seneca Sayuga storyteller. Hayuga. Hayuga storyteller. Hey. <laughs> um, she's a theater director and a playwright, and she is the great granddaughter of Melinda Cayuga, a Seneca matriarch who exemplified the loving strength of the clan mothers. Uh, Fern, can you uh, talk us through your approach to storytelling? Hello, my relatives. Fern Naomi Renville and Makiapi. My name is Fern Naomi Renville. I am Dakota. 
I'm an enrolled citizen of the Siskin Wapaton Oyate, formerly known as the Lake Traverse Sioux Tribe. I'm from the Lake Traverse Reservation in Sisseton, South Dakota. But my people originally were exiled from the Twin Cities, what's now the Twin Cities. That is where my people traditionally, every winter after the hunting season had wrapped up, we would head to the um, coolies and valleys around the Twin Cities area for the winter lodge. The winter lodge was when the big camp split up into smaller camps where people would come together in these winter lodges for three months to hunker down together during the blizzards on the prairies. And every one of these winter lodges would work to um, recruit and lure a storyteller to their lodge with stories of the softest buffalo robe and the warmest fire and the best meat to eat because you would not want to be in the winter lodge without a storyteller, <laughs> not for those long three months. And so when everyone had come into the winter lodge, the storyteller was also an artist and would always be an elder, generally speaking, mostly male, but not uncommon for a female artist either. And so, the storyteller would begin at the very beginning of our story, the Dakota origin story, and would proceed to spend the next three months sharing the entire mythic arc of the Dakota people, the story of how the world was created, of how we were created, of how the rest of creation came to be, and what our relationship, our responsibilities, our obligations are to the rest of creation, to our relatives. So this winter lodge that my people came together every year for, everyone in the lodge would be immersed from start to finish in our entire mythic history over the course of those three months. And one of the things that I have learned as a Dakota storyteller is that traditionally most of our stories weren't recited. They were actually sung and there were parts for audience. So it was very interactive. Think uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show. There were parts for elders, parts for young people, comedic parts. It sounds exactly like the Greek roots of modern theater because modern theater began as a Greek religious festival that told the great mythic stories of Greece on stage. And so, Every winter, the storyteller would lead the people through the story arc and end up right now, end up with this year. What significant things happened this year? And everyone in the Winter Lodge together would collectively come to a consensus about the 13 most significant events that happened in that year. And then the storyteller artist would take those 13 events and interpret them via 13 images in a spiral onto a beautiful buffalo robe that was prepared just for this to be the winter count of this year. So everyone in the lodge together could say our entire story from start to finish from the beginning of time to right now. That is a kind of health and healing I cannot even imagine in the world we live in today to be so very much on the same page, believing the same story, knowing the same stories, at peace in the same story. Right now we live in a world of conflicting, battling stories. <laughs> so for my Dakota people to be healthy, then to thrive would be to spend every winter sharing the stories of who we are, passing them on, processing this year, and making something beautiful out of it to remember it by next year. So one of the things that I'm doing right now as a storyteller is I'm working in the Twin Cities to create outdoor land-based theater that is in the Dakota language that shares our traditional stories that tell about 
these places and our relationship to them. And what that is making me understand is that theater and storytelling are one and the same. So Native people are theater artists and have been since time began. There is no place on this earth where people don't tell stories, where we don't share the stories of where we come from. Now, if you've heard Roger um, sharing with you, he's probably already told you about how this is not a unique thing for Native people. All people have origin stories. Look to the Disney catalog. <laughs> There's quite a few there. But all people come from other people. Nobody is born out of a vacuum. And all people have stories. And if you follow those stories, you, they will lead you to ancestral teachings and ancestral identities. And so this medicine in the form of stories is medicine from our ancestors. It's literally power and strength and love from our ancestors in a form that is impossible to quantify. I have to say one thing, and that is that the reason that I know my Dakota stories and, and my uh, fellow tribal storytellers, we have a very strong Dakota storytelling tradition. It's because when we were removed from our homelands and placed on a reservation and carefully surveilled by the military and the church, we had a very short list of things at that time that we were allowed to do. We could no longer sing or dance or share ceremonies. But one thing that we were allowed to do was share our traditional stories because at that time, even settler culture did not um, perceive traditional stories as anything more than fairy tales, harmless. What could it hurt to let the Indians tell stories? <laughs> but these stories are vehicles for healing, for knowledge, and they're completely embedded with everything you need to know to be a good Dakota person. Because like everyone else in the world, until just a couple hundred years ago, Dakota people were entirely an oral culture. Most humans living on this planet, including most non-Native people, just a couple generations ago were quote unquote illiterate. Literacy is a newly acquired human skill in the big scheme of things. And Native people, because we understand the power of words, are well situated to be writers and be highly literate. <laughs> so the thing about storytelling though, because it predates literacy and because it even predates um, language, before we were speaking with this sophisticated language, flapping our jaws, <laughs> we were grunting, moving, shaking ourselves. We were communicating. So storytelling is housed in the body. And when we're telling a story, we're using our whole bodies. We're using, we're tapping into an older form of physical communication. Now, if you've ever watched people reading, as opposed to people storytelling, you will notice if people are reading, their bodies tend to be very still. When someone is telling a story, they can't stand still. Their body becomes animated and they start flapping their hands around. <laughs> Our bodies help us tell stories. So there is an old, old form of communication that gets tapped into with storytelling that is powerful and it cannot be replaced by um, literacy. Maybe in a few more million years, we'll have evolved into something else. But <laughs> at this point in our development, storytelling is still how we communicate emotionally. Now, the other thing about storytelling and traditional stories, how many of you have kids who love to be told stories over and over and over again? Yes or watch the same movie over and over again. Why is that? One of the things that I have, um, as a person who comes from a background of trauma and has spent my um, adult life as an educator, making um, learning spaces that are um, amenable 
to people who come from trauma. <laughs> that trauma, if you were to define it, is loss of trust. Think about the same story, the same ending. Little kids love to be reassured. They know how it ends. I know how this ends. I know how this ends. There's something deeply reassuring about knowing that you know the story. You know how it ends. You know how the story goes. Now, our up here mind is saying, oh, we don't need those traditional stories anymore. Now we have science and data, but your psyche inside still needs to make sense of your life and your experiences with a deeper story. So those deeper stories also do something to us physically as listeners and as a teller. I'm always in a state of deep relaxation when I'm done sharing stories. So thank you for the invitation. <laughs> but there is literally the, something that happens to you and your bodies as you listen to me. Now, you may find yourself a little bit more relaxed than you were before I started talking. You may find yourself holding less tension in your body. And possibly, as I'm talking, you've slipped out of thinking and ruminating about your own thoughts and are just listening to me. That's healing. That's medicine. We're so much into fight or flight mode, all of us these days. So to have an opportunity to have a little biohack that slips us out of fight or flight and into a relaxed mode, that's also the prerequisite for real communication and real learning, which I believe is a big part of healing, that a big part of healing is the knowledge of knowing that we have the power to heal inside of us and that others can activate that and help. So I also want to say that I was raised by my grandmother. She was the first nurse practitioner in the state of South Dakota. She was an Omaha and Seneca Cayuga woman who was powerful, was a tiny little thing, never raised her voice. <laughs> but she ran um, a big IHS clinic here and started a tribal nursing program. And she exemplified and embodied health but it was her ability to share stories and tell about her work through stories that, was, that made her such an effective person. She, she, she was never one to lecture. She always had a story to tell. But um, I'm gonna, I'd love to tell you a story right now. Is, is anyone ready? <laughs> awesome. The story that I'm going to share with you is a story that every time I tell it, I feel a little more healed. Now it's a little long, it's gonna take up the whole 15 minutes and um, I might abbreviate a little bit. It's what's called a remember when story. It's a story from the Yankton Dakota people who are a band related to mine, who live not in the Twin Cities, but by the um, Missouri River. In South, in South Dakota. And the Yankton people um, tell this story that happened about 400 years ago, they say. So that's what's called a remember when story, when it happened in memory and people can still share it. So this story takes place in a time before contact when Dakota people were living as they had since time began. Well, one of these ways was to um, kind of constantly be in a conflict with tribes to the, the west of us. I'm not going to say who, I'm not going to mention their name, you know who I'm talking about, those ones up in the mountain <laughs> that would come down to the east and take captives and steal horses, yes. So in a Yankton, Dakota village lived a woman. This woman was very well known and very respected because she was a gifted lodge maker. She could turn buffalo skins into the most beautiful lodges for families. And this woman, she had a knife that she had received when she came of age, like all Dakota girls when they turn into women. And this knife had many red marks painted on it. Each red mark mem uh, memorialized the 
lodge that she had made for a family out of buffalo skins so that when she died and was buried with this knife, this Dakota woman would have a story being told by her knife of all the good things that she had done for her people. Well, this woman was just like that. Now, those people to the West, that tribe I was telling you about that would come and steal our people, they had also heard of this woman and because of her abilities, she was a target. And yes, they came into her camp one night and stole her away and took some horses too. Now, this woman was not only a talented lodge maker, she was also very strong in her heart and spirit, and she was smart and strategic. So as traumatic as it was to be stolen from her own camp and her own family, and yes, she had her own children, and taken away, she already from the very start was careful to observe everything that happened so that she could find her way back because she was already plotting her escape. And so these people took her up into the mountains to their camp and she was forced there to make lodges for the enemy people. And that is what she did because what else could she do? Yes, well, this woman worked on um, convincing her captors that she had accepted her fate. And she very carefully added while she was being forced to make lodges, she would take pieces of leather and sew them onto the bottom of her moccasins to make them extra thick. And she would take little bits of meat and berries and fat and squirrel them away and put them in a little bag hidden under her where she slept. And weeks passed and then months. A long time passed and this woman waited her chance. She bided her time and finally it came. Finally, the men of this camp left to go find more horses and possibly captives. And they left her alone in this camp, just the old people and the children. And that night, as soon as it was dark, this woman took her robe and the moccasins and her food, her washna, her dried meat, and a bag full of water. And she split, she took off and she ran all night long. When it started to grow light out, she found a thicket and she crawled under it, brushing her tracks away behind her because she was very afraid of being tracked. And so for four days and four nights, this woman traveled by night and slept by day until she arrived back at the Missouri River. And there, now she had crossed the Missouri coming the other way on horseback, the horseback of her captors. But now she had no horse and the water was higher. And so she wasn't quite sure how she would get across. Now, as she stood there on this bluff, overlooking the river and the plains out past it, she could see that there were huge dark clouds rolling across the prairie and approaching and lightning. The, the thunder beams, the wakia, were sending bolts of lightning and huge booms and the rain started to pour and the wind started to come and whip up that rain and blow it like horizontally right into her face and she was starting to get cold and her food was gone by now and all of a sudden she was very exhausted and hungry and tired and she decided to take shelter she could see that in the bluff of this um, overlooking the river that there was all these rock ledges and out Croppings. And she crawled down there and crawled under an outcropping of rock. And she scooted as far back into that space as she could to take shelter. But that rain and wind were really whipping in. So she scooted back even further. And then she felt air behind her, air blowing. And she turned around and she reached behind her. And she could feel that there was an opening, that there was a cave. Yes, and I'm starting to get dark out and the thunder and lightning were really going wild now. And so this woman, she crawled into the entrance of that cave and into the cave and it was quiet and dark and warm and dry in there and the floor was soft and dirt and she couldn't see anything, but she felt suddenly safe and sheltered. For the first time in four days, no, for the first time in 
months, she felt safe. And so she fell into a deep, deep sleep. And when she woke up in the morning, usually on the prairie, those big storms at night are followed by the most beautiful mornings. The sky is so blue and the birds are singing. Everything's clean, beautiful. And that's what it was like. She opened her eyes and the sunlight was streaming into the door of that cave. And she could see a little bit of blue sky out there. And then she looked around the cave and she saw that she was not alone. No, there was a family of wolves also in the cave. She was, she froze because very close to her was a father wolf. And he was standing with his head lowered and his ears back and the hair on his neck was standing upright and his tail was upright as well now this was a pose of a of a wolf who felt threatened and behind him was a mother wolf she didn't look threatened she was just lying with her nose on her paws and climbing all over her were their children they didn't look scared either but this father wolf stood in front of them and he growled a growl in his throat and this woman oh I am so sorry. I didn't mean to stumble into your house and intrude this way. You must be good people to have let me sleep instead of throwing me out. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to intrude upon you. Please forgive me. The woman hoped that the wolves would forgive her, but the father wolf came too closer to her and he growled again. She closed her eyes so that she wouldn't have to watch herself being eaten. And the father wolf brushed by her on his way out. He had left. He had gone out of the cave. And behind him now, those little children wolves rushed forward. Their mother continued to lie there and watch. But the little babies came and started climbing all over her and smelling her and sniffing her and licking her and playing with her and this woman who could resist this before she knew it she felt herself relaxing and she started petting these little baby wolves and playing with them and just taking a moment of joy and then that father wolf came back and she grew afraid again now she watched as the father wolf came and stood before her and he made a sound like, oh, oh, like he was going to throw up. And he did. He regurgitated a big piece of deer meat right in front of her. Yes, this is how father wolves uniquely alone feed their children. And so you might say, I would never eat a piece of regurgitated deer meat but maybe you've never been this hungry. And I bet your parents told you to always be a good guest and just eat what you're served and not complain. Well, that's what this woman did. She ate that piece of deer meat because she was really hungry. And it wasn't as bad as she thought it would be. In fact, it was kind of good. And as she ate, she felt her strength return to her. And then she saw that the mother and father wolf had come and were both standing in front of her. Now this woman did not speak the wolf's language and they didn't speak her language, but they understood one another because they were both parents. And this woman said, huh, yes, I will be glad to babysit your children while you go out. I promise I will guard them like my own. And that, that's what happened. This mother and father wolf left the den and left the woman alone with their children. And boy, did she have her hands full. They weren't an easy group to look after. But they had her laughing and completely forgetting her own troubles. So time flew by. And the next thing she knew, those parents had returned with a lot of meat for the children. Because two hunters can hunt better than one. And so that night, once again, she ate with the deer family, uh, with the wolf family. 
And that night, instead of being an uninvited guest in the den of the wolves, she slept there as a guest. And the next morning she woke up and thought, today I must continue on my journey. But those little wolf puppies, as soon as they saw her awake, came over and started licking her face and playing with her. And she thought, what is the harm to stay in one day? And so she did. She stayed and rested and played that day and looked after the children while the parents hunted and slept well that night and slept so safely in that wolf den. And then another night passed and then another night. And before she knew it, a week had passed and then another until a couple months passed. And then that woman, she said to herself, if I'm going to make it back to my own people before winter, I need to leave. Tomorrow I will let my friends here know that I must be on my way. But she said one more day with them. She couldn't quite explain why she was so attached to them, but they had taught her a great deal about generosity and kindness and hospitality, all things that Dakota people pride ourselves on. And this woman, that day, the next day, the wolves left to go hunting, but usually they were home before dark, not this time. Evening came and they had not returned. Nighttime came and they had not returned. The moon rose and it was finally about midnight before the woman and the wolves who were pacing in front of the den saw on the horizon. They saw that mother and father wolf approaching and they could see that the father wolf was walking strangely. And so the wolves, the wolf babies and the woman ran out and met them. And when that woman got up close to the father wolf, she could see that he had an arrow through his neck, that he had been shot with an arrow. <gasps> oh no, humans have shot you. They don't know what good people you are. Oh, I am so sorry, let me help you. Now, ordinarily, of course, an injured wolf will not allow a human to touch it. But because this wolf trusted the woman, he relaxed while she put her hands on his neck. Now wolves have all this loose skin around their neck. So if you try and bite their neck, you usually just get a mouthful of skin instead of any muscle or vein. And the arrow had gone through that fortunately. So the woman took that arrow and broke it in her hands and pulled it out very quickly. And she held that arrow up in the moonlight and she could see that it was her own husband's arrow. Yes, Dakota Min would place um, their signature feather arrangements on, the, on their arrows so that they could say who shot somebody. And so this woman could see that it was her own husband who had shot this wolf who had saved her life. <gasps> Please forgive my husband. He has no idea what he's done. I am sorry that helping me has put you at risk this way. But even worse, he's a very good hunter and tracker, my husband, and he will be following you. He will shoot you again if he sees you because he doesn't know what good people you are. You must leave tonight. And that is what happened. It must have been a very sad goodbye. But this woman did say that she would return in one year's time to bring a gift, a feast, a thank you to the wolves for saving her lives. And so they parted. And that woman went and sat on the bluff and waited for her husband to come because she knew he would. And when dawn came and the sun rose, she saw first one horse on the horizon and then another. And these riders approached and it was her husband. It was her family. Now, when they had gone out looking for her to look for this woman who had been kidnapped, stolen from her family, when I can only imagine when, the, when they thought they would find her, that they would have been prepared to find a very traumatized person. How surprised they were to find her sitting calmly and peacefully on this bluff waiting for them and to share the story with them of how she had survived. 
and how these wolves had taken care of her and then how her husband had shot this wolf not knowing that this was the same wolf who had saved her life and so the people understood immediately that this woman had had a sacred experience and they took her she was not traumatized she was strong she was healed she had been healed in the lodge of the wolf family by their love by their kindness by their playfulness and so a year later this woman and her whole camp returned to that place on the missouri river with a whole buffalo and they laid it out to feast to those wolves now they say that the wolf, woman walked up and down that area of the river all day long calling for the wolves and all day long no one came until finally after the sun had gone down and the moon had come up on the horizon the people could see a pack of wolves approaching and the woman when she saw them she started running towards that pack of wolves and they ran towards her and the people say that when the wolves reached her, one of them put his paws on her shoulders and knocked her over on her back and started licking her face and the others did the same and they were crying with happiness to see their adopted mother. And then the camp fed the wolves and feasted them and thanked them for their kindness towards this woman from their camp. And that is the story of the woman and the wolves, a Yankton Dakota story that um, was a very favorite story of Vine Deloria Sr. And now I'm going to let you folks talk. <laughs> yes. um, are we doing the breakout groups yet? Or are we having the, um, yes. do the break? Okay, excellent. Yes. Good. Is there excellent. any particular question Fern they should be thinking about or should they just be reflecting on the whole story? What does this story have for you? Really, because it's not a prescription. And whatever you hear and learn from the story is what you were meant to hear. For me, it's a story of healing. And it's a story of, um, of um, trauma being healed in unexpected ways. So my question to you is, how does this story then um, help you to heal or think about healing or how does it feel for you as, as a healing piece of medicine? Perfect. All right. I'm going to put everyone into some breakout groups. You'll have around eight-ish minutes, and then we'll bring everyone back for a quick, large group discussion. So I'll open the rooms now. All right. Here's where you guys get to practice not being shy. There are no wrong answers. Everything you say will be genius. <laughs> but I also want to say that, um, so for instance, um, one of the things that um, the a woman I was in a breakout room with shared that um, for her, this, the healing teaching in the story was um, not being attached to old things that were old assumptions and let opening and trusting new things that can come along. Well, we all know how hard that is. <laughs> but um, that is something I appreciate hearing from her and thinking about how this story teaches that. So I learn as a teller by hearing your feedback <laughs> and none of it is wrong. It's all helpful. So if I could ask somebody from each group to share um, just to take away from what you spoke about and learned, that'd be beautiful. Hi, Fern. This is Twilight Gleason. Um, in my group, I had um, Olga Lazariba with me, and um, it was really quite interesting because um, me being Indigenous and her being um, Russian, you know, it's 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 the two different cultures, and we had lots of questions. Well, I shouldn't say lots, but I think in our group is like, why in a lot of these Indigenous stories are there the people not named? you know, like what was the woman's name? You know, it just refers to the woman. Um, for me, I think what I got out of it, which was really um, uh, fun is that no matter 
who you are, whether it be human, animal, there's always love, you know? And so that's kind of what my take on it is the love portion of it. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. This story just embodies love to me. <laughs> At the end, can yes, yes, I will share about more about Minnesota and where you can learn more. <laughs> Does anyone else want to share? Hi, my name is Meredith, and I uh, I just want to check in with the rest of my group because we didn't pick a, a spokesperson. So Shadi and Kayla and Sarah, is it okay if I speak or would one of you rather go okay? Uh, yeah, so there were a couple cool takeaways from our group. Uh, oh, Kayla mentioned that, that she thought it was um, really cool to see how two people that would normally be in conflict, a human and a wolf, were able to work together and find you know, community and family together. Uh, and, and, and that's something to take away that sometimes people that can't get along or we don't think they can get along can find ways uh, to get along. Uh, and and Shani also had a similar thought of, um, you know, getting rid of our, our expectations and preconceptions about things and and I was thinking that that for me the fact that the woman took this time when you would think she would just want to run home immediately she took this time to be with the wolves and find healing so that when she was able to return home she came back as as, as not traumatized but as, as someone that was full of peace mm -hmm. so those were some of the things from our group I love that. Mm -hmm. Totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're echoing what our group found, which is sometimes you don't find your support that you find is not in expected quarters <laughs> or someplace where you maybe you were afraid of. Cool. Thank you for sharing. I love that. Does anyone else have something they would like to share? I, I'd like to share. <laughs> um, I, I really like, like what really spoke to me a lot was the beginning of um, knowing who this person was so strong and so loved in her community, so much to offer. And that was so suddenly taken away from that. And she never uh, felt she prepared to go back <laughs> from, from moment one. It's almost like she knew her inner strength and she went with it and planned mm -hmm. to be back. So a lot of patience and strate strategy. <laughs> <laughs> that she had a to role model <laughs> yes amazing yeah yeah i was very fascinated by by that it's like she paid attention <laughs> in the way to that other place so that she could be back that was very inspiring <laughs> i'm glad you enjoyed i'm glad you found it as inspiring as i do <laughs> and somebody somebody just wrote that she rested and she played which really does um, drive home that point that the last person shared about how she had this unique opportunity to rest and heal from her trauma before she reconnected with her family. And the implication perhaps is that she needed to do that, that it wouldn't have been as healthy if she had not had this place along the way to be um, made to feel loved and whole again. One of the things, hi, I'm Shelly. One of the things that we talked about in our group was 
um, how beautiful working with nature as opposed to fighting against it is as an idea. And also in terms of the sort of survivorship of the story, um, that the woman is self-resilient until she can't be anymore and then has to take help and healing from others Ooh. Ooh, and, yes. until she is able to restore herself and then she's able to give back again and sort of help help the wolves and then is prepared to leave on the next part of her journey once everyone has been sort of restored. Do you see what I mean about how brilliant you all are? <laughs> These are beautiful insights into this story. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. All right, since we're getting close to the, uh, the top of the hour, I'll go ahead and say thank you, Fern, again, for sharing everything and sharing the history on storytelling and how it still is very applicable to all of human society um, and for leading us through the storytelling circle. And again, thank you everybody that provided these um, honest and uh, thoughtful reflections to the story. Um, really encouraged by all these reflections. This will be kind of a semi-final remark. Um, the banner unveiling uh, for the artwork for Rogers um, and Fern's artwork will be on October 10th um, at uh, from 12 to 1230. Um, and it'll be in the, in the vessel traffic circle. And, um, after this, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Fern. Um, and if she wants to talk a little bit on her project that she's working on in Minnesota, um, people are welcome to stay for that as well. Thanks again, everybody. That was great. Thank you, Josh. So for whoever wants to learn more about this Dakota Theater Project, you may go to wakantipi.org. It's W-A-K-A-N-T-I-P-I.org. You can also find it through the Lower Phelan Creek Project. You can also Google that. Either one will take you to the website of something that just had a groundbreaking. It's going to be the first ever Dakota Cultural Interpretive Center. So since Dakota people were exiled from the state of Minnesota, and by the way, that law was never formally reversed, there's still a, league, a bounty on our Dakota heads legally. Um, but since then, this is the first formal footprint that Dakota people will have in Minnesota on our, um, our site of our original homelands, with, uh, the um, area of St. Paul that I'm talking about now is called Wakan Tipi, and it's our ancient burial mounds that look out over the city from the highest place in St. Paul. And underneath those burial mounds in a cliff face, there's a cave, which is also called Wakan Tipi. It's a sacred cave that has an artesian spring in it that runs all year round, never freezes. And back in the day before contact, our Dakota women would go into that cave. Only women were allowed. And it was where we gave birth. And our new little babies would be washed in that artesian spring water. And inside the cave were painted um, images of Untehi, the serpent spirit who represents death and destruction, but also protects laboring women and, and um, babies. And so 160 years ago, when Dakota people were moved from the city, the Schmidt Brewing Company took over that cave and made it into a giant refrigerator for, <laughs> for beer. About 13 years ago, a group of non-native local neighbors from um, this area now, which is now you know, a, a nice neighborhood, <laughs> started um, a local group to take care of this land. And then they started to learn about it. And they discovered that these um, burial mounds were 
underneath what is was was now a playground and so those people decided that they were going to form a nonprofit to look after this land and that they were going to start learning from Dakota people. Well, that was about 10 years ago. Once they learned from Dakota people what a sacred site this was, they decided that what they needed to do was to replace themselves with Dakota people. So 10 years later, the nonprofit started to steward this sacred site in Twin Cities is now led by all Dakota people. And it is the first such site in the state of Minnesota that is being collectively and collaboratively restored through a um, relationship between the Minnesota DNR, Department of Natural Resources, and five Dakota bands who are collectively um, reclaiming our burial mounds and this sacred cave and the springs below it and uh, um, several acres of riverfront property that represent a last surviving piece of the um, traditional oak savanna that used to be all up and down the Mississippi River. So my Dakota people were such popular traders because we had acorn pancakes and maple syrup among other things. <laughs> so it was a, an abundant place where Dakota women were Minnesota's first farmers. So the fur trappers, the missionaries, the military, everyone who came, just like on the East Coast, they survived by buying produce from native women and meat from native men. So in all of the public narrative in the last 150 years, we've heard that Dakota people are nomadic, um, hunter gatherers, you know, savage barbarians, etc. When in fact, Dakota women, my great great grandmothers, lived in a permanent village on the shores of what's now St. Paul and had permanent plant, um, planting mounds that we had built out of the muds after the spring floodwaters would recede on the Mississippi. We'd gather more mud onto our mud mounds and we had corn and beans and squash and um, potatoes and pumpkins. In my band, we had a sacred society of women whose work was to grow pumpkins. And only very special people could grow pumpkins. We knew the value of pumpkins. <laughs> and so that is the work that I am doing right now to share those stories and working with Dakota community members, we will be sharing those stories in Dakota, out of doors, and it will be part of the public programming at Wakan TV when doors open in late 2023. So it's ambitious. It's a very ambitious project, but <laughs> this is where I need to be right now doing this work. So I really appreciate the invitation and the audience, and thank you for all your feedback and um, seeing up. Oh, beautiful, you got it, excellent. Lower Grayling Creek, there's the link, cool. If you're ever in the Twin Cities, anyone, just look me up and I'd be happy to take you for a tour. Thanks again, Fern, that was wonderful. Bye all. Bye all, Kadamaye, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Gracias. <laughs>